start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, I guess welcome to our first uh, uh, webinar of our of the uh, Afterman webinar series. Um, my name's Jason Reardon, and I'm joined today by Brad Jolliker, who's going to be talking to us about uh, end-service bus property encryption with AWS KMS. So. Hi, guys. Yeah, I'm Brad Jolliker. Um, I'm a architect for Afterman Software. Um, I've been building software for about 20 years. And uh, the last few years, kind of specializing in message-based systems and uh, doing a lot of in-service bus work. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of share how to do property encryption, which I think is a kind of an interesting problem with message-based systems, um, to, you know, to encrypt the data within the messages. Um, and I have a blog article that I've done on this and I have an example project. Um, and hopefully I'll stop saying, um, and, uh, we can get forward, go forward with this. <laughs> So cool. you want me to go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, yeah, that works. That's good. All right, so well, you know what, before then I do have a little bit of a, a bullet point of a uh, summary. So what I'm gonna go through is I'm gonna go through and what's end service bus real high level. Um, what's property encryption, AWS, KMS. And then to do our demo, we're gonna leverage local stack and Docker Compose, uh, which are really cool tools to use when you're working with AWS. Um, and then we're going to run example. So we're going to take a look at what this looks like in, uh, in a demo scenario. Um, so end service bus is really, it's a framework. Um, a lot of people get confused and I think by the name where it says end service bus and they think it's an actual thing. Uh, end service bus is primarily in my mind, a framework, right? And it, it implements the message patterns that are really easy to say, like retry, but kind of difficult to do in a really reliable way. So uh, using end service bus in your solution, instead of going directly against your, your messaging queues, means that you have that battle hardened um, framework that implements those patterns. Um, and then they give a great way to kind of uh, integrate all of the different um, things that you need. So property encryption is one of those things that you can implement with in, in, inside of end service bus framework. Um, and particular gives you a really nice kind of a, a place to inject your encryption. Um, so there's, there's two types of encryption that you can do. One is the property encryption, which we're going to talk about. And the other is body encryption. Um, my preference is the property encryption. And the reason, you know, I prefer that is it allows you to encrypt what's actually sensitive data and leave the data that's, that's not sensitive available so that you can debug what's going on in your system. Um, you know, if you do that body encryption, it's all encrypted. You really can't see what's going on other than the message headers, which are helpful, but a lot of times it's good to be able to see, you know, here's the transaction identifier. Um, you don't need to see the account number to debug it necessarily. Um, but you know, other things in there are really helpful. Um, one of the big challenges around encrypting data in message based systems is key rotation. Um, and that's something that end service bus, um, helps you with KMS kind of makes it a little easier. Um, but that's, that's probably the, the first challenge you run into when you say, Hey, you know what? I want to encrypt the data that's within my message. Um, and security folks go, okay, well, you need to be able to, to rotate the key. And the first thing you realize is, okay, I can encrypt the data with a key. But then when I rotate it, new messages get created with the new key, old messages get created with the old key. How do I deal with messages that 
um, don't show up on time or they're in flight when we do the key rotation. You know, you don't want to take an outage and take all your endpoints down and rotate the keys and bring them back up. Um, typically, you want to be able to rotate it on the fly. Um, and Service Bus has a way that you can basically have a key ring that rotates. Um, but KMS actually makes it a little easier because KMS is actually doing the encryption. So you're just going to give KMS um, an identifier and it knows based on what's encrypted, which key to you and that identifier, which key to you. So it, it'll handle your key rotation for you. Um, so yeah, AWS key management, KMS, if you're in the, the AWS ecosystem, this is probably your best option for key management. It's a, it's a fully managed service. One of the really interesting things about this service is when you use it, the encryption doesn't actually happen within your service your encryption happens in KMS. So you give KMS your identifier for your key, which key do you want to use, and the value that you want to encrypt, and it gives you back an encrypted value um, and vice versa. This means that your services don't have direct access to the keys. And that's how also the, the KMS can handle that key rotation. Um, so, a lot of the other scenarios that, that you do encryption, it happens within the service. So the service actually has to have access to the keys. That gives you a more secure solution. The obvious downside is now you have network traffic. You're sending the data to KMS and getting the, the data back. If you're running all within the AWS infrastructure environments, that's still a concern, but it's a, a little bit less of a concern. Um, so you have to weigh what's what's what works best for you in your environment, right? Jason, does that does that all make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So the the example that I have out in GitLab. It's kind of a multi-purpose example. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna show KMS with it, but it's really set up to show how do you use end service bus in the in AWS, and the it's really designed for the endpoints to be um, put in a Docker container and deployed in that way. We're not gonna actually put our endpoints in a Docker container, but we're gonna use Docker to set up our environment on our local machine, which is which is really cool. We're going to use lo local stack and Docker Compose to do that. Um, this diagram is just kind of a context diagram to show that we have three endpoints. One is basically a web application that communicates with an end service bus Saga endpoint. And a Saga endpoint is going to manage our state for us for this fake payment process. Um, and the, the, the actual work to, to process the payment, if we had any, this is an example, uh, would happen in this payment process worker. It's gonna send the message back through. So if you look at this example, there's uh, a number of kind of interesting things that it does, um, but obviously we're making a payment and we probably have sensitive information like account numbers, um, or you can imagine you might have credit card numbers in a and a make payment uh, workflow. So in this case, we're gonna want to encrypt our account number. Um, the rest of the the rest of the data in the in the message is not that sensitive. You've got like an amount, um, a routing number, which you could say is sensitive. I could kind of go either way. Um, and you know, of course, the account number and a date and time, right? So the account number. In our in our fake policy is is uh, the thing that needs to be secured. So um, let's look at our Docker Compose so we can kind of get our environment up and running. And you know what? This is still running. I'm going to go put this shut it all down. So. 
in that GitHub repository is a Docker Compose file. And the prerequisite for running this is going to be, if you're on Windows 10 Pro, my recommendation would be to use Docker Desktop. Um, Docker Compose kind of comes in, in Docker Desktop. If you are not on Windows 10 Pro, then you can use you can use um, Docker Toolkit, and Docker Toolkit does all of the same things, but it's not quite as uh, integrated as far as your your usability is concerned. So it's a little bit different. But Docker Docker Desktop is is really the, your best option if you're on Windows 10 Pro. So is that specifically like if you're on Windows 10 Home or something, you should use the toolkit? Yeah, you, at this point, you're, you'll need to use the toolkit if you're on Windows 10 Home. They are changing that. The last I looked, it wasn't released. So it could be released at this point or in, in the next month or so. Um, that would be available to you, uh, Windows 10 for t Windows 10 Home. So definitely take a look. If you have an in, if you have Windows 10 Home, I'd go check that out first, and if it's not available, then do the Docker Toolkit, uh, and you would find that information on the on the Docker website. So the Docker Compose basically has our different services that we're going to use, and for our example environment, we're going to use local stack to provide. Uh, S3 and SQS, which is right here. Local stack has a, a, a whole host of solutions or, or let's see, we can go look at local stack here. So they, they offer all of these different AWS services and you can install it directly on your machine. I think that uh, Docker works best because you can fire it up real quick and it works. And when you're done, you can shut it down and delete it and it goes away. You're not working, worrying about uninstall and that kind of thing. So we're going to, we're going to focus on just the SQS and um, S3. KMS is included in here, but I had some challenges with getting KMS configured with the keys. So I actually went and grabbed a, a, an image for, for KMS directly. So we're going to use that. Um, and then in service bus persistence, we're going to use MySQL and that's our other service. So we have three services, local stack, our database and KMS in this Docker compose. So the, one of the things that you'll need for KMS is um, a key and there is this c.yaml file that will basically load up a fake key for us. So don't use any of this in production. You don't want, you don't want to use any of this in production, but uh, for example, this works. So our key ID that's in here, that's, that's that ID that you send KMS along with your data to encrypt it or decrypt. So I am using um, a really handy plugin with the uh, VS Code, this Docker Compose plugin. I highly recommend it. That makes it so that I can just find my Docker Compose file, right click and do Compose up. And you'll see down here in the terminal, it's going to go pull the images if it needs to. And it's up to date. Why did it not start? Hmm. Interesting. They already started. It might already be started, so I can check that by saying, and look at our dashboard. So this is the local stack dashboard. And this 
wouldn't be doing anything. Okay, so it, it looks like it's up and running already. Nice. Um, but you can see it went out and it looked at those different images and made sure they were up to date. So that's something I kind of glazed over, which is in each one of these services, you define which container you want to use, which image, and it automatically pulls it down and sets it up. We could probably spend a few hours talking about the details on this. So if you want to follow along and, and pull this example down and run it, that Docker Compose is out in the repo, the, GitLab, the uh, GitHub repo. You just pull it down if you've got Docker Compose and Docker and Docker Compose installed, it'll automatically run you to Docker up and you're ready to go. So what was the next on our list? We want to take a look at the actual implementation. So here's the, here's the cool part. Now, In service bus has um, this I encryption service. And I forget if you need to install a specific NuGet package for that. Let's see. It's probably going to be in here. In here. Yep. Okay. So we have this end service bus encryption message property, NuGet package that we've added to our, our, our project. And then we have this iEncryption service uh, interface that we need to implement. And that interface has a, a decrypt method and an encrypt method. And what's gonna happen is uh, end service bus has a, has a pipeline with behaviors in that pipeline. And when a message is um, picked up off the queue, it's gonna go pass through all of the behaviors in your pipeline. And then your handler is gonna handle that message and it's gonna go back up through the pipeline. So in this case, our pipeline is gonna include this behavior to encrypt and decrypt. And encrypt, we're basically gonna use the client from that Amazon provides for KMS. So this Amazon key management service client is going to be sent in and looks like we're sending in the key here, right? That identifier so we can go do the encryption. So encrypt, we're going to use the client to encrypt it. We need to do some base64 encoding. Um, and then we also need to set the header in our message with that encryption key identifier. In the KMS scenario, that's not quite as important because you're pretty much going to have one ID unless you decide you have to change it for some reason. But you're basically going to have one ID. If you were using um, a different provider for encrypting your data, you might you might send in, you might have a like a, a dictionary of keys. And we need to make sure that message has an identifier to the key so that when you decrypt the message, you know which key to use. And that's done with headers. And later on, we're going to take a look at what the raw message actually looks like, and we can see what that key, where that key goes. This key has an unfortunate name. Um, really, we can put whatever value we want in this header, but this is the this is the header that um, I'm guessing this is the first provider was used this type of key. So this is the label for it. You could probably override this, but I've chosen to kind of go with the flow and you know, squint my eyes, put my blinders on and go, I'll just use this name uh, because it kind of plugs in with all of end service bus functionality that way. 
Does that make sense? Or, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, as a uh, from yeah. Obviously, I'm coming from an end service bus background, so I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Uh, so the decrypt is kind of the same thing, but we're just doing it in reverse. Um, there's not a there's it's it's pretty straightforward. So again, one of the one of the the upside there, there's an upside and a downside here. The upside to how end service bus does this is they give you a clean place to put your specific logic in there. So however you want to store your keys, however you want to do your encryption, they leave it up to you. Um, the downside is you have to you have to figure it out and build it yourself. Um, my, I personally think that this is a I think this is mostly upside because what I found is every organization has their own policies and their own opinions on how encryption should be implemented and where it needs to be implemented and where do you store the keys and i think it would be really difficult to you know have a standard offering that uh, is out of the box for this uh, so the ability to say you know what we can do whatever we need to do for what whichever organization i, I think is a plus so once we have our I encryption service, then we then we can can put that in our configuration. And let's go take a look at. So in my example, I have this one method that has all of the things that I've configured for my end service bus endpoints in my um, you know fake payment domain. Um, so we've got our transport that we've configured. We've got our persistence that we've configured. Uh, we've got our message routing. In this case, we're using installers. It's a demo that makes it a little easier so that it creates all of our queues and database structures for us automatically on startup. We've got our conventions and that could be a whole other interesting webinar. Um, and then here we go, we've got our configure property encryption. So let's dig into that a little bit. So we go into configure property encryption. Here we go, here's our key. And that key is the same, let's see, let's see if it makes me a liar, but it should be 36 DC. Yep. So that's the same thing here, this key. What? Um, obviously you can see from my comments, don't, don't hard code this. This is just for a demo. And then we need to create our Amazon key management service client. And this is part of the Amazon SDK. In our case, because we're using local stack, we're going to override a couple of properties. Uh, it normally you wouldn't have to use these. You wouldn't have to override these, but basically we need to say, here's where the actual service is. Normally, AWS is AWS. It, it can figure that out on its own. We're going to do HTTP instead of HTTPS just to keep it simple. I wanted to make this so that everybody could just pull everything down and it runs without a problem. Uh, don't do this in production, especially for your encryption stuff. So we'll create a new service. And then here's the really cool part. So we can create conventions for our messages. So an end service bus, when you have your contracts for your commands, for your different messages, so your commands and your events, this basically allows you to say, anytime I have a property in one of those contracts, in one of those message contracts, I'm gonna automatically encrypt it. And what you can do is basically, you know, Every organization has a list of uh, values that are determined as they need to be encrypted when you when you send them somewhere. You can take that list and basically implement that list in these conventions and basically say, anytime you see one of these names, labels, as far as a property, encrypt it automatically. Um, as long as all of your endpoints are using that same convention, um, 
that's an extra level of protection that things, you know, don't get, can get forgotten. Um, the other thing that you can do is basically say any property that any property name that ends with encrypted, we're going to automatically encrypt it. Um, so when, when your message goes through the pipeline and it sees one of those properties on the message, it's going to encrypt and decrypt automatically for you. One of the things that I just realized we haven't talked about was the fact that once you get into your handler, the, the values are already encrypted and decrypted. So when you're talking about your, your business logic, it doesn't have to worry about encrypting and decrypting. Let me see if I can show an example here. So Saga's process payment Saga. So, you know what? That might not be the best one. Payment processor or worker. So we're gonna look at the payment processor. So this is where you would potentially, oh, it doesn't do anything interesting. We'll go back to the saga. So in our, in our handlers for our messages, for our saga, um, we'll see in the console there when we run this, that this number, this account number is not actually encrypted in this context. It's encrypted when it goes across the wire in the message, but in your handler with your business logic, it's unencrypted. So it, it's similar to like transparent database encryption when you're working with like SQL Server, where your, your, your code doesn't have to worry about the encryption. It's happening kind of behind the scenes. So in our case, we've got our property encryption uh, that's set up and configured. It's gonna use KMS. And just to show what this is doing in the message, I think I'll run this with, with this disabled first. And I am gonna use, this is gonna show up on a different screen on my machine, but I'll, I'll pull them all over. So we'll fire up this, this solution. So here's our saga, it's starting up. Here's our worker. And here's our web app. And this is a demo, so this is kind of silly that uh, you probably wouldn't do this, but essentially I've set this up so that every time you refresh the page, you process another payment and you get, here's your response back. So let's look for in our saga, we can see our account number is, is not encrypted. And this is, of course, if you log it out, that's probably not a great thing, but for this demo, we're logging that just so we can see in the saga, you know, in, in with your business workflows or your, your, your business logic, it's unencrypted so that you can use it. And if I turn this endpoint off, we can refresh this. And I run this. And if I've done everything right, we can actually use the AWS CLI to see these messages. Let me try this again. There we go. Here's a message. So 
And this is actually a little hard to see here. So let me see if I can copy this into VS Code and get it to show up a little bit better. So this is um, a message that we pulled from, I didn't describe that. So essentially what I did is I said, receive a message off of our SQS queue. And that pulled that message off and you can see this is the raw message. Uh, remember we didn't turn on, we, we didn't enable our property encryption. So there's no header up here for the key. And if we look at the body, and this is actually, here's my, here's my headers that I was talking about. It's not in, it's, you, we're not going to find it in here. Um, and the way end service bus does SQS, that transport is implemented. There's a, all of the headers and then the body is actually just a another is is kind of embedded in there, and it's base sixty four encoded. So we can take this guy, we'll copy it into this utility, and we can see we can decode this, and we can see our account our, our account number is not encrypted because we don't have property encryption enabled. So that's the that's what the raw message looks like. Right? So if we go back to our configuration and we comment out or uncomment our property encryption then fire this up again. the messages off the queue that weren't encrypted and trying to decrypt them? So. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like. Yep, so if the response is not happy about that. Well, it's it's Thanks. a warning yeah. to retry it. So eventually it'll, so those are retry. Yeah. Um, This is actually gonna make it a little more challenging to, all right, so here's what I can do. That's gonna make it, make my demo a little more challenging if I don't clean those up. You could uh, enable the purge on start. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna let it, that is a good idea, I think I'm, Gonna just let it do its thing. So, I think I only hit it four times. All right. So, if we try to fetch. Okay, so our queue should be empty now. We'll re-enable that. We'll start this guy up. See if we have better luck. There's our saga and our worker. And we can see our account number is still showing up as is unencrypted in the handler. 
And if we turn off the worker, we run some here. All right, we got a new message. And you can see in here, there will be a key identifier. Here we go. Here's our, here's our key so that it knows how to go decrypt this message. So that's in the header. And we're going to grab the body here and decode it. And we can see our account number is now actually encoded, is encrypted. So, success. So again, we if we were look at this, that web page was this guy. We had a saga in, in between managing our state and then the process worker is what we were stopping. So we were looking at um, messages that were headed to this guy. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Not like being able to offload all of your, all of the keys and everything to, to AWS. Yeah, that was, uh... I, I um, before this this project that I put together, kind of as a proof of concept, I I'd not worked with KMS, but it definitely seems like the it's a really nice solution for for this problem. Um, it, it yeah. and really one of the interesting things that that um, you know the 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 security folks you can run into a lot of um, resistance from them based on the whole idea of whether or not the data in the messages is encrypted and who can see it. And even though SQS, you can set those queues up so that they're encrypted at rest and they're encrypted during the transport, that gives you PCI compliance, but that doesn't protect you from you know, uh, an administrator getting access to your system and looking at the messages, you know, legit for, for probably legitimate reasons, but you know, you have, you have people that do have access to those queues or if a message goes uh, awry for some reason that shouldn't really happen, but you know, people, people are concerned about that. What happens if a message goes somewhere it's not supposed to go? Um, having that property encryption and being able to show the security folks like this is how we're going to protect this it 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 it'll take i've seen it happen a number of times where they go from i'm not sure about this end service bus thing to yeah we need end service bus <laughs> it it really it wins them over when once you show that hey you can do this and this is something that yeah could you code it yourself you could but you're gonna spend a lot of time doing it and it's not gonna be, it's, it's never gonna be the same level of, um, you know, battle tested uh, that the end service bus solution is, is gonna give you uh, just because the reality is it's not the, those, those patterns are not the things that the business is paying you. You know, they, they want their feature, right? They want payments to be processed. That's their goal. If you say, hey, I need to build in these different patterns to do this in an efficient way, uh, you, you can probably talk them into a little bit of time, but it's never going to be the same amount of time that you would need to get it to the level that, that End Service Bus provides. Yep. Um, so another thing that I was thinking that that's kind of cool with, I guess, not necessarily the, uh, the, uh, the KMS 
part of it, but the property encryption is the way you set it up. You configure the individual endpoint. So you could potentially only decrypt fields per uh, endpoint that actually needs them. Right? Right. The, the fields per, per the endpoint. For the properties. So yeah. Like, yeah. Are you saying per, per endpoint within your system or I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So if you had like your, your saga, well, so like, let's say your saga doesn't really need to know the account number, but your payment processing endpoint does. So you could not configure the saga endpoint to treat that property as encrypted. True. So it just True. encrypted all the way across. Right. And it's getting a little paranoid because it's all kind of in memory at that point. But... Right. Um, you could do that. I don't, it seems, uh, I, I think, um, typically where I've seen this used, you, you would say here, we're going to, we're going to establish, here's the conventions and how we do encryption across the system, at least within a, within a bounded context, right. uh, you would want to do it in a, in a consistent way. Um, or, or it'll probably end up causing you problems. You could configure it, um, at a really granular level and a very use case specific level. But I think you would find that um, it, it, it causes, it ends up causing pain. Yeah, more trouble than it's worth. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's cool. So for the, uh, for that, uh, that like AWS call to grab the message, does that actually pull it out of the queue or is it just kind of reading it? The, the call out to AWS. So the, um, the console that you had that you, ah, oh, this guy mainline. here. Yeah. Right. Where I'm reading the message. So with SQS, you have to basically consume the message and then put it back on the queue. Um, MSMQ, you can go, you can look at the messages in the queue and not, not actually consume them, um, which, is a, which is a nice feature of MSMQ. But SQS, if you want to inspect the messages, it's, it's going to pull them off and then you can see it while it's, mm -hmm. while, and then it's not available for a period of time for the other endpoints. Um, but yeah, the way I'm reading it, 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 I consume it and it goes back onto the queue. Interesting. That's cool. I was just curious about that. Yeah. So did you have any questions about, um, like the local stack and the, and the Docker compose components? Um, not necessarily. Um, I guess the, the local stack, is that just like a repository of Docker containers that somebody put together or? Um, it's, it's a, it's a project that, you know, it is a, it is a composite, I believe of other projects. So this project out here, yeah, they've, they've pulled together a number of these different mocks of different services, um, and package them together and can be hosted kind of all in one place. Um, but, and, and you can choose to, you, you kind of pick and choose which ones you want to fire up. In our case, mm -hmm. you know, when I first started using this, I would let it fire up all the services, but it takes a lot longer and takes a lot more system resources. In our case, we're, we're kind of picking from the menu and say, just grab a couple of these services uh, and just fire them up. And it 
just saves time and, and resources. Um, they they do also offer there is like a, a paid pro version of local stack that adds a bunch of these additional services and you could do that or you could you know create basically your own composite with uh, docker compose which is essentially what i've done because i think like rds is not part of the free offering and that's why i use docker compose to spin up so i grabbed just the the regular my sql image and fired it up you could use uh, at um, SQL Server. There's there's a Windows container and a Linux container out there for SQL Server. And in my case, I just used MySQL because it's uh, it's simple and easy. Yeah. Nice. Do they so, do? Is it all? Uh, is the local stack stuff? Is it all AWS? Yeah, it's only AWS. Um, Unfortunately, I wish Azure provides some emulator, an emulator for some of its services. Mm -hmm. um, it would be it would be cool if somebody would create a, a project to to emulate Azure services in a, in a broader sense like this. Um, yeah. One of the one of the other yeah. cool features about local stack is, and I've not tried this, but from what I read. You can actually config, configure it to throw exceptions, like like uh, AWS subscription exceptions, or um, you you can you can simulate what happens when when those AWS services don't do what's expected, uh, which I think could be could be very fa very uh, valuable in, yeah. in like integration testing scenarios. So we're using it in a probably more of a developer demo type scenario, but you can actually leverage local stack in, in integration tests, um, which is, which is kind of cool because now you can say, let me just spin up a copy of, of my environment or, you know, AWS that's all encapsulated in my build and deploy pipeline. And I can run all my integration tests and you know fake failures in the aws environment and see what happens and i don't have to worry about oh, i spun up a bunch of services in aws and for some reason i didn't tear them back down and you know i end up with a big bill because i provisioned all this stuff and it just sits out there running yeah yeah that's pretty cool yeah. azure needs to uh step up their game yeah so so we're gonna we're gonna do this webinar thing uh, again in in a week or two weeks i guess i think we said two weeks yeah yeah i think two weeks um it would be Especially we'll would try be cool to if uh folks i'm gonna stop sharing um yeah. We can see if uh, you know what folks want to want to hear about. Maybe they'll chime in in the comments, and and uh, you know, if folks have questions about end service bus or just even message based systems. Um, we we you know, you Jason and I have a lot of experience with those types of systems, um, but we have a whole team at Afterman Software that has um, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, beyond our 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 knowledge that um, we can definitely leverage in the in this uh, webinar format um, and and bring them in as guests. Yep, definitely. And if anybody has questions relating to the uh, to Brad's uh, to the topic, this this webinar in general, uh, feel free to leave those in the comments, and we can. Uh, try to keep an eye on this, try to answer what we can. Cool. Um, yeah.
Cool. So I guess we'll try to uh, plan on doing like a uh, bi-weekly cadence. Um, hopefully we can, can get some cool content out. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for, uh, for joining me for the uh, webinar. It was, it was pretty cool. It's very informative. I'm probably going to try to use that in the future. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right.